AI adoption is accelerating, but enterprises still face two big challenges, making their data AI ready and keeping it resilient against today's cyber threats. Pure Restore just announced a series of innovations from accelerating LLMs with NVIDIA to launching an AI co-pilot for Kubernetes to deepening cyber resiliency with new recovery capabilities. Today, we have with us Prakash Tarji, General Manager of Digital Experience Business Unit at Pure Storage to unpack what this means for enterprises. Prakash, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. You folks are making some huge announcements today. Can you talk about what challenges are enterprises running into with AI and cyber resiliency that you are trying to address through these partnerships and the announcement that you made today? Yeah, so this announcement is all about the enterprise data cloud. Our enterprise data cloud is something we unveiled earlier this year in Vegas, but now we're enhancing it because the problem, as you see fit, is operations. When people need to manage things, previously it was fragmented, siloed, complicated, and AI has just fundamentally changed the game. If you could go ahead and say, you know what, instead of me having to do all of this work, could you go ahead and have intelligence around what's happening? Because previously automation has existed, but it was disconnected from observability. By bringing the data that we've collected over time together, we can now take intelligent action and reach into the ecosystem of MCP connectors. MCP in AI has made this very easy to reach cross ecosystem to solve challenges. For example, if you wanted to migrate from VMware to Kubert, it simplifies that challenge. And when you do so, how do you do it and maintain your protection levels, all of your policy, your storage protection levels, and your cyber resilience? So that's really what this announcement is all about. One major highlight is your NVIDIA partnership. How does the pure key value accelerator with NVIDIA Dynamo tackle KV cache bottlenecks in large language models? And what performance improvements can customers expect? Yeah, look, there's two. What's fascinating is this is almost like a twofer. You get better performance because you're using a caching style and you get efficiency where you're not having to recompute things through the caching mechanism. So it's actually kind of both, which is interesting. So we've got our FlashBlade product. Our FlashBlade product has been optimized for AI because internally it's actually built with an internal key value store that has a metadata engine that can scale indefinitely. So in AI workloads, you need something with a scalable metadata engine that's based on a key value backing. Now, when you combine that with metadata cache for GPU with KVA, what you're saying is, hey, you know what? When people are asking things, you don't want to recompute things. You want to push down. And with the Dynamo, you can actually now make sure you get, we've seen, you know, 20x improvement on cache it uh, for performance, as well as that means you're not recomputing and saving you on your GPU cost. So the, you know, basics are very fundamental here where I think, you know, we're at the early side of AI efficiency, right? You see all, everything happening in the press around people spending money on building farms. But, and, you know, now I think we're at a precipice where we need a lot more innovation in the industry around efficiency in AI. And this is just one great example. You also have the new Pure One AI co-pilot for Portworx and its integration with the model context protocol. It seems like a leap forward. How will this change how teams manage Kubernetes clusters moving from reactive troubleshooting to more predictive, proactive operations? Yeah, so I think well, let's break it down into three areas. The first one is just the intelligence and troubleshooting. If you're dealing with Anytime you want to build like AI, right, kind of natural language interface um, here, you need to train on the data. So we've now trained on our Portworx data. So when someone actually goes ahead and needs to be like, let me do performance or diagnostics or understand the stateful or stateless cluster, they can actually just go ask the copilot and we can actually tell you what's going on, right? Now, on top of that, normally people would have said, okay, well, I can only do that within the peer ecosystem. Where MCP comes in is we've published our copilot with an MCP interface. So wherever you're sitting in your agentic workflows, now this is one thing you can tap into without having to reinvent the wheel. 
So one thing is we publish outbound an MCP interface where other people can use us, right? Um, but in the same way, we have client connectors where we can connect to other MCP servers from other vendors. So if we wanted to reach into OpenShift and be like, in OpenShift, like, this is what Portworks is telling us, but let's go figure out any resource or compute configurations in OpenShift. We can now, in our copilot, ask questions of both, right? Of our own domain space and our ecosystem domain space. Normally in the past, if you wanted to program some of these things, you'd be like, ah, let me call their REST API. Let me call their REST API. The problem is REST is a specific format. So you have a high barrier of entry of going ahead and having to program each interface with strict governance around the endpoint and the API definition. MCPs made that more of a loose construct where your communication path is more English, right? So anyone can change their interface within the constructs of MCP, right? Um, without actually breaking the ecosystem integration. What this means for every store software vendor is interop costs go down drastically because your interoperability from the ecosystem is much less fragile um, on an MCP basis versus kind of strict REST governance basis. Since you're talking about integration, let's talk about fragmentation quickly. There is so much fragmentation right now in the agentic AI space with new frameworks and platforms popping up almost daily. How do you see shaking out in the data space? No, look, I think there's two areas in fragmentation. One is at the data plane, right? Previously, you know, people would be like, here's my block storage, here's my file storage, here's my object storage, right? And then here's my high performance block storage, here's my like low low performance, here's my high performance, you know, cost optimized or performance optimized. So, and over time, and you see this with most of our competitors as well, they've got different operating systems for all of that. With our enterprise data cloud, we have one unified data plane from archive to AI. So you don't need to deal with that in silos or in fragmentation. You can actually consolidate your data plane. And with Fusion, you can actually manage that as a single pool of storage. Because previously, data was vertical. It was encapsulated to this application. I need this performance for SAP, this for Oracle, but in Salesforce and the cloud, I need this. And like, it's all different, right? In the world of AI, it's made the data needs horizontal, where the data that's sitting in each one of those applications needs to interrupt and work together because AI has to train cross horizontal, cross vertical application. You need to train horizontally. Some vendors are saying, okay, well, you have to bring all of your data into my ecosystem. That's like, if I look at any SaaS provider, they're like, your first step is load all your data to me. But like, are you going to do that with every system and everything to use AI? That's kind of ridiculous. So data is now a horizontal problem and fragmentation stands in the way. The other area where we see fragmentation is in cyber resiliency because typically everyone tells you that they've got a good ransomware detector, right? Every, every vendor is going to be like, I've got one. And other, next guy is going to be like, I got one. So think about the customers. The customers now have a fragmented landscape. It's not who's got a detector. It's everyone's got one. I've got too many detectors. You have to associate them to understand your relative threat levels across all of the signals you're getting. And before something goes wrong, you need to dynamically respond. So with our enterprise data cloud, we're really focused on reducing the fragmentation, both at the storage layer with an intelligent control plane, at the data layer with this unified data plane, and even at the cyber resiliency layer by unifying the fragmented detection and response landscape. I want to dig a bit deeper into these. On the cloud side, you announced Pure Cloud Azure Native and unification of Portworks with Pure Fusion. How do these simplify hybrid and multi-cloud management, especially for enterprises trying to balance VMware, traditional workloads, and cloud-native applications? Well, I think there's two things going on, right? If you take a look at, you know, and VMware is a great use case. We've, we've announced that there's kind of four paths we see. People could either stay with VMware, they could switch hypervisors, they can go to the cloud, use virtualization in the cloud, or go to something like Kubevert and Kubernetes. Like those are kind of four things that people can do. In the hybrid multi-cloud world, when people decide to go to the cloud, we've built a new solution called uh, Pure Storage Cloud with Azure native services. So it's a first party service, just like you would see in the Azure's block storage. You see a first party, 
first-party service that's a run and operate integrated that we've co-engineered with Microsoft. And for the folks who say, you know what, I, I'm afraid that like a, this thing with VMware and Broadcom is going to happen again. I don't want to take risk with yet another hypervisor. We see those people mostly going to something like KubeVirt because it's an ecosystem. It's tied into Kubernetes. And because of that, it gives you optionality where you're not really stuck in kind of vendor lock-in land. So we see a lot of work happening kind of in movement in the industry happening there. And with our control plane of in integrating Fusion into with Portworks, we've now extended that control plane to give you a single pane of glass across traditional workloads and modern Kubernetes workloads. Now I want to talk about security, as you mentioned. Security and resilience were front and center in the release with integrations like CrowdStrike, Veeam, and now Pure Protect Recovery Zones. How do these partnerships and announcement strengthen Pure's ability to help customers recover quickly and securely when threats hit? Well, look, we have a platform approach to this with our enterprise data cloud. The first layer is you need built-in security, right? Most people aren't hacking in their logging in. So you need enterprise-grade identity and access controls. You need to make sure that you can find log detections of, you know, someone who's logging in who's not supposed to log in. Um, so all of those things become kind of a base capability. Now, every vendor has detection. That's why I was talking about this idea of connected detection. So Pure One now has multivariate detection where we can look at anomalies and behavior and things that might look like ransomware or denial of service or data exfiltration. But CrowdStrike it looks at network intrusion. Antivirus looks for virus signatures, right? Ransomware scanners look for ransomware signatures. And you even have like backup providers that are trying to go ahead and do signature detection there. In unstructured, you have Saperna or Veronis looking at, you know, detection in unstructured objects. So because there are so many different types of signature, you can either do signature, you can look at heuristics, or you can look at behavior. But you have to associate all of those across the industry to create this idea of connected net, uh, connected detection. And like, think about it this way. You have ADT and Ring, right, in home security. ADT is kind of like, okay, my alarm's going to go off when someone's broken into my house and stealing everything. Ring is interesting in that it's kind of multi-layered, where it's like, oh, my camera told me someone's in my front yard. I can yell at them over the camera. Oh, they're still going to the front door. I can call my neighbor and say, hey, you know what? Can you do something? And then like when they're in the house, you can be like, okay, now I need to call the police because someone's doing a thing, right? So you've got a layered dynamic response, but it's because you've connected detection and response. We're doing that with storage in a response. Our dynamic response is powered by these recovery zones. You need to have your recovery zones defined around what your types of responses would be in different situations. And then connect it to your different threat levels so you're not waiting till something went wrong to resolve the problem. You touched upon this earlier, but I want to go a bit deeper. For customers who are already using Kubernetes and open source tools, how does this integration with Portworks enhance their experience and align with the principles of storage as code? Uh, it, look, it's super well aligned with those principles. Like Pure has always been an automation first company. Ever since we started, you know, 15 years ago, a lot of our early customers were all SaaS comp companies that built us using automation. So we've always been automation API developer first. Now with Portworks, we're natively integrated into the Kubernetes ec ecosystem and workflow. It's something that people understand. And for the traditional guys that actually don't or aren't integrated into Kubernetes, right, the Fusion fo follows more of that concept that storage people are familiar with in their traditional ecosystem and extends them into that world. So we've bridged kind of this world of Kubernetes and non-Kubernetes with this intelligent control plane concept that spans both. Finally, before we wrap this up, what is Pure's long-term vision for making data truly AI-ready across enterprise? And how central are partners like NVIDIA and your broader ecosystem in achieving it. And before we talk about that, can you also explain how would you define AI-ready data? Well, so here's the thing, right? Um, there's a lot, lot to unpack there. But, uh, generally, you want to make sure for AI that 
you can train on your data and you can do inference to apply it. Those are two different things, right? So we've got optimized infrastructure for deep training environments with EXO with one of the fastest, um, you know, workhorses that exist with our Flashblade EXO. And with SR2, we see more inference deployments in the enterprise, right? We have portfolios that can address that for different types of workloads for both across the training and inference spectrum. Um, but as customers have to hit the maturity model for AI, one, what is your enterprise architecture for ensuring you get good data? Training on bad data is always a thing. So it almost always starts with data collection, data observability, data ingest, et cetera. And that's a problem that storage has been dealing with for a really long time, right? Is this low latency ingestion? Is this high bandwidth ingestion? How do you paralyze and ingest? And how do you clean, right? And I think there are emerging standards with open telemetry and other things that are making formats more standardized for, you know, machine type data. Um, and then, you know, in human oriented data, it's all about data quality and data preparation, right? So as we work towards the maturity model of AI for everyone to do everything everywhere, you know, it's collect, train, infer, roll out, and then, you know, associate cross ecosystem because you're not going to like, a, you know, where we're getting into interesting use cases now is when I've trained on my data set and OpenShift's trained on theirs and we need our two data sets to work together. And that, you know, brings us back to the MCP conversation. Prakash, thank you so much. There was so much to unpack here. It was a great discussion. We covered a lot today. We covered how Pure is uniting AI readiness with cyber resilience, making it easier for enterprises to run faster and safer in hybrid environments. Thank you for your time today, and I look forward to the next conversation. Yeah, thanks. As always, great to talk to you again. And for those watching, if your team is tackling similar challenges, we'd love to hear your stories, so don't hesitate to reach out to us. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and stay tuned for more conversations on AI on TFIR.